When comics first began to be sold on newsstands, it was pretty comparable to the Old West. Anyone could try and find success for themselves, but there was never any guarantee. There also wasn't anything really proven to work as a formula yet, so the creative aspects were still in their infancy. Once things started to pick up momentum, some prominent figures were at the front line, and one of those people was Will Eisner. If this is your first time with us, I've found that a lot of modern media is pretty impenetrable to newcomers. My goal is to provide a breakdown and guide to the DC universe and the order of creation, so it isn't quite as overwhelming. If you have a favorite character or story and it isn't in this video, it's likely to be found in either a previous one or a video coming later down the line. So to the newbies, welcome, and to the oldies, welcome back. Let's talk about DC Comics. While Batman was the big hero of Detective Comics number 27, Slam Bradley was the one who filled that role from numbers 1 to 26, taking a back seat once the Caped Crusader leapt onto the page. The Earth 2 version of Bradley was a pretty cut and dry protagonist, as were most of the others surrounding him at the time. Being the early days of comic books, there was this weird mix of A, writers who weren't super experienced with the format, or sometimes honestly writing in general, and B, those same writers not wanting to overcomplicate things, so anyone could pick up a random paperback issue and not be at a total loss as to who the characters were, and potentially even relate to them as a self-insert of sorts. Slam Bradley was a Cleveland PI who earned his nickname by usually foregoing the clever or investigative areas of being a detective and instead throwing hands at the problem, which varied wildly from aliens to time travelers to minorities. Yikes. So quickly dropping that version, let's jump continuities and move on to New Earth. In New Earth, we got a Slam Bradley working at the Metropolis PD, but Editorial wanted to bring back a more classic version of the character, minus the dicey xenophobia, so this guy was retconned to be Slam Bradley Jr. Slam Sr. was brought in, an older, grizzled detective operating in Gotham City, being a more than little worn down after his Golden Age sidekick, Shorty Morgan, got the axe at the hands of some low-level drug dealers. Slam was an honest cop with that sad moment in his history, and he only really cropped up a couple times before Prime Earth. The latest iteration of our fisticuffed friend still fills the role of older senior detective in the GCPD, looking like he should really be considering just outright retiring at this point. He's worn down, tired, and enjoys a stiff drink while thinking about the good old days. Meanwhile, his son got dropped during the switch to Prime Earth, replaced with a daughter named Sandra, who's carrying on the legacy begun by Slam, spending her days as a televised detective while busting a whole new era of criminal wrongdoings. Slam doesn't come up much these days for kind of obvious reasons, unless it's time to pay some tribute to the first detective of Detective Comics, which usually includes him bumping elbows with his usurper, Batman. Now, I said Slam Bradley was the first detective of Detective Comics, and while I stand by that statement, he wasn't actually the first to do detective work. Speed Saunders, ironically, beat him to the punch there. Cyril Speed Saunders was yet another action man akin to Barry O'Neill who, unlike Barry, was a federal agent, but oftentimes found himself kinda doing whatever the writers wanted to write about. Hop into New Earth, and Saunders gets a little rounding out, though frankly not much. It's here that he's rewritten as a lifelong friend to the original Sandman, Wesley Dodds, and as such, has always been somewhat adjacent to whatever drama they've got going on. As the sands of time creep onward, Saunders is now an old man, but still plays informant to the latest iteration of the JSA, especially since his granddaughter, Kendra, has become the latest to take up the mantle of Hawk Girl. We haven't spotted Speed Saunders in Prime Earth yet, but I'm sure somebody will bring him back in some capacity.
Will Eisner was the child of Samuel and Fanny, who met during a family gathering. I'll let the phrasing of that set in for a second. Like, they were distant relatives, but I'd say if you meet for the same family function, it isn't quite distant enough. Anyway, Will himself was born and raised in Brooklyn, poor as immigrant families sadly often were. Things were tense for a number of reasons, and the number was a high one. Will was bullied by his anti-Semitic classmates for being Jewish, though he wasn't practicing. His parents often fought about anything that came to mind, usually instigated by Fanny. She was disappointed that Will carried his father's interest in art, angry that Samuel didn't have a bigger income, and then when the depression struck, that spread to her berating Will, a literal child, for not adding to that income. Boils my blood a bit, that last one. But despite these adversities, Will carried on becoming an art student and pulp magazine fan, eventually working his way into a gig as a cartoonist for the New York American, as well as a cover artist for a few pulps. Scoot up to 1936, and Will's friend, Bob Kane, suggests that he consider comic books, since it's a newly introduced medium that seems to be picking up some steam. Now, he didn't start working for DC until a bit further into his career, but he did draw for Fox Comics and Quality Comics, which, if you've been keeping tabs, got absorbed into the DC monolith sometime later. And Eisner actually played a significant role in that. See, in 39, he was told to craft a knockoff of Superman named Wonder Man. When the day came that National Alley Publications became suit-happy, Fox was put up on the chopping block. Eisner testified with little coercion that he was told explicitly to make a Superman derivative. With that, the axe swiftly fell. After his days with Fox, he created a third-party hero named The Spirit, one of the big three of major pulp comic heroes alongside The Shadow and The Phantom. I plan to talk about each of them as a separate exploration one day, so I won't dive into that just yet. Sometime in 1941 or 42, Will was conscripted into the military, serving his term, making educational comics for the GIs, and then eventually made his way home. From there, he carried on with The Spirit, having found pretty major financial success. Once publication ended in 1952, Eisner went into semi-retirement, seemingly not intending to get back into comics at all. Tragedy also hit Will Eisner during his wilderness years. In 1970, his daughter, Alice, passed away from leukemia. Since Eisner's personal life was kept so private, most didn't even know of the event until he wrote about it 31 years later. Then, in 1971, Eisner was a board chairman for the Croft Publishing Company when he was invited to the Comic Art Convention by Phil Seuling. Will was enamored with what comics had become as a culture, having been purposefully unaware during the time he left it behind, but now it was bright and beautiful and, probably in many ways, nostalgic. The man was back on his horse. He wrote and drew new stories, including some for DC, and was recognized with awards and honors galore. Into the 21st century, in the final years of his life, Will Eisner became a frequent lecturer at the School of Visual Arts in New York. After his passing, DC Comics held a memorial service in Manhattan's Lower East Side as their way to show respect to the fallen titan, celebrating the full life lived by one of the first major comic creators. And that's where we'll leave our story for now. If you liked the video, give it a like, and if you liked me, Go ahead and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.